Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here, for being interested in this topic, which is to see what the tax haven does to all of us, to our democracy, to our economy, and also to explore what will happen if and when we have Brexit. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our speakers, uh, Mr. John Christensen from uh, Tax Justice Network, with whom I have been working for, I should say, decades, I believe. So we can appreciate together the progress and maybe some setbacks. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Simon Bovers uh, from uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. We have Olivia Peirce from Oxfam and Laure Briot from Transparency International. All these people will take the floor. So this is a very special moment in European history, as we are all aware of. Because of the Brexit, because of all the turbulence that we see in the UK, but also in the EU. And our purpose today is to see uh, what will happen if and when uh, the UK leaves the EU and whether we are well, not, well enough prepared to withstand um, a tentative of the UK to become even more a tax haven with its offshore centres. This is the theme of uh, the panel one, uh, where you will find my colleague Molly Scott Cato, uh, John Christensen and Olivier Pierce. But before we start this panel, uh, I have to tell you that for our group, the Greens EFA, tax justice is one of the priorities. We have been working here on this topic, I myself, for 10 years, and it has been the top priority for our group for five years now. So time is, has come also to try to, to make a um, kind of bilan, as we say in French, of what has been done, what has been achieved. And um, as you all know, we have had se several investigative committees after uh, all the scandals, especially after the Panama Papers. We had, a, we had an investigative uh, committee and we have made many recomm recommendations. One of these recommendations was to set up a unitary taxation of multinationals in order to get rid of the transfer pricing issue and the use the multinationals are taking of the tax haven in order to optimize their uh, taxes. And I'm happy to say that this work had gone very well in the Parliament. The, the Commission presented in two, late 2016 um, a proposal that were voted uh, by the Parliament in March this year, where we, uh, where we set up the, the rules for unitary taxation of multinationals and also taxation of uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the GAFA. And um, this, this proposal were voted very huge majority in the Parliament. And when we had Jean-Claude Juncker coming to testify in front of uh, this committee, Tax uh, 3, he was asked by my colleague Sven Giegold, who will join us, whether he would agree to circumvent the rule of unanimity within the Council in order to get this proposal through. And his answer 
and I will show you later on, was yes, three times yes. I agree to use the Article 116 in the treaty, which allows the Commission, when there is a distortion of competition, to use normal proceeding, majority, qualified majority vote. This was two years ago. And um, I think that we believed him in my group that this will go through. And it was with great sadness that we saw the communication from the Commission last Tuesday with uh, the French Commissioner on Tax, Pierre Moscovici, which didn't achieve anything when he was Minister of finance in France, and he will leave the Commission also without having carried out this very important project. Because the commis this communication said that the, the Commission will try to circumvent unanimity because they are aware of how dangerous this rule is, how much it block the development and the evolution of tax issues. But they will use Article 48 in the treaty, which is what we call the clause passerelle. And using this clause, you have to ask all the national parliaments whether they agree to change the legal basis for tax matters. And they all have to agree. It is, you require unanimity to get there. So you see, this is a trick in order to be able to say that Commission did something, but they did in reality give up. And uh, they are giving the tax havens inside Europe seven more years, even if this project went through, because they say they will go very progressively, starting with the TVA, uh, uh, added value tax, and to end in 1925 with the CCCTB, if they've managed to get this clause passerelle through. So you see, we have very small chances that this clause will be adapted because it needs even Malta to agree. And uh, as you all know, for the Luxembourg, for Luxembourg, 25% of their national income comes from um, the, this industry. So um, what I believed was that the head of our commission, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, being the former prime minister and minister of finance and the man who has created this industry in Luxembourg, that he would not give up on this 25%, and unfortunately, I was right. But we will not give in on this subject as a priority, and I know that many of my colleagues are running for a new mandate, and they will carry on this fight uh, later on, on the next uh, term. Unfortunately, we are about to lose our UK members, that are so valuable to us, doing such a wonderful job. But you never know, we never know. So they're still here. Uh, just to underline some of the damages uh, with the, the tax havens, you might have followed the football leaks scandal, how the transfer of players are used for money laundering. One of the whistleblowers are the Portuguese former football player, Rui Pinto. And I'm sorry to say that he was arrested two days ago in Hungary on request of the Portuguese judiciary. So they have not arrested those who are doing the money laundering or the corruption. They are arresting the whistleblower. I think Anna Gomez is not with us, but she would have told you, she is from Portugal, that she don't trust totally the Portuguese legal system. So 
we hope that uh, he will not be sentenced or he will not go in prison in Portugal. So we know that tax havens are aggra aggravating the inequalities and that they are participating uh, in the terrible situation we are in today with these inequalities that Thomas Piketty has described in his book. And uh, that is also expressed, I think, by the coming into power of populists a little bit all over the world, uh, in, in the US, in Italy, uh, but also uh, the Gilets jaunes in France. The tax issue is at the center of their revolt. And the fact that we do not deliver here in Europe right now on this question is terribly, terribly serious. Uh, I will just talk one more minute and then I will leave the floor. I talked about uh, um, the French economist. We also have Gabriel Zuckman, who since the OECD started working on the BEPS project, has looked at the figures of the multinationals. And he at once saw that the benefit, benefit are getting up and the taxes are getting down. It don't work and it will not work. They are trying to fix what is not fixable. The only way forward is unitary taxation. And uh, <clears throat> Gabriel Zuckman showed that 40% of the benefit of the multinationals are stuck in tax havens. And that means some 350 billion euros worldwide, 120 billion for the EU and 20 billion for France. So it shows that the developed European economies are the losers and the biggest profiters are the US uh, owners of the companies. So we need to be more ambitious to fight tax havens. That is for the, for the Commission to come. I also want to tell you a little bit about um, a group of people uh, which are called ECRIT. Uh, who are working on the reform of international transnational companies they are also they are also advocating for unitary taxation but today they are all alone and i do recommend you to read their report and i will finish by saying that other group published today a new study giving the real effective tax rate of uh, the European countries compared to uh, the uh, theoretical uh, rate. Uh, this study shows that, for instance, in Luxembourg, where the nominal rate is 29%, the effective tax rate is 2%. And for France, the theoretical uh, tax rate is 33%. The effective tax rate is 16. So with this word, I will now uh, leave the floor to my colleague uh, <coughs> Molly. Uh, she will introduce you to the panel and continue this work. The floor is yours, Molly. Thank you very much, Ava. And the first panel is, I think it's fair to say, a pan panel of three angry Brits. So I'm the first one, and I'm going to give you a sort of whistle-stop political introduction to what's been going on with Brexit and its relationship with the issue of tax avoidance. Um, I would like to be prancing around to release a bit of my anger, but since I can't do that, if I speak too quickly, just wave at me and I'll speak more slowly. When I've done my brief introduction, I'll pass over to, to Frantisek, who's going to actually then... Um, coordinate the rest of the session and I'll make sure we have time for questions. So um, it's clear that tax avoidance was a strong motivation behind those driving the Brexit campaign. 
The complex web of finance stretching between the City of London and the British Overseas Territories gives them easy access to some of the world's most secretive tax havens. You can see here a website I put together after the referendum when I was sort of in that state of thinking what the hell just happened. And uh, I found that there is actually not, not a conspiracy theory, but a conspiracy fact behind Brexit. And people seeking to avoid tax and financiers are some of the key players. So the leaks of documents in the Panama and Paradise Papers, which were very useful to our work here in the Parliament, included many of the key Brexit actors. And it shows that they're very much at home with the dark arts of tax avoidance. So Aaron Banks, I'm ashamed to say I'm his MEP. He lives just near Bristol, where I live. Um, he favours tax havens, including the Isle of Man, Gibraltar and the British Virgin Islands. Jacob Rees-Mogg's investment fund is managed via subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands and Singapore. Lord Ashcroft, who's a major Tory donor, himself a non-dom and a pollster for the Tory party, he achieved notoriety through exploiting the UK's non-dom status and also was a, a prominent player in the Paradise Papers. So it's clear that the EU is making strides. Of course, I agree with Ava to say it's far too slow, but some of the... Um, the uh, law we've worked on, such as the Directives on Administrative Cooperation, does start to shine a light on what some of these wealthy people are up to. And we've also had some success in the area of money laundering. But these laws have been fought against by key British political actors and by exactly some of these people who've been driving Brexit. And I think it's important to understand. People often say, well, you're so rich, you know, why don't you mind giving a bit of that money back? But it's not about the money, it's about the power with these guys. They don't want to think that anybody can tell them what to do with their money. And they don't respect the democratic norms that say that politicians set tax rates and people and companies then pay those taxes. So this issue started with... Um, a comment made by Philip Hammond to Veltam Sontag when he said, we will change our economic model. And he proposed that they would, that effectively Britain would cut corporate tax rates and turn ourselves into some sort of offshore, you know, Singapore in the North Sea without the palm trees. It doesn't sound very appealing, being stuck on a cold island with uh, Jacob rees and Aaron Banks. Anyway, um, you know, the plan was, the idea was to go for tax cuts and major deregulation. This was followed up by our Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who recently made a speech in Singapore about what he called the invisible chain of democracies around the world. It was rather bizarre that he made that speech in Singapore, in my view, although in his view, Singapore exemplified the dynam dynamism and vitality of Asia. So this is the kind of dynamic country he thinks Britain should turn into. He thought the UK could learn from its strategic approach to maintaining a competitive economic advantage. The bizarre thing is that he considers Singapore to be a democracy, a country that has the death penalty, no freedom of assembly and oppresses LGBT rights. The Tax Justice Network published its Financial Secrecy Index in January last year and Singapore was fifth on the list, just behind Hong Kong, obviously another part of the world with very close relationships to Britain and the City of London. Cayman Island was third, with the US and Switzerland at the top. So these are secrecy jurisdictions where you can't find out what's happening to people's money. So I think when Jeremy Hunt talks about the invisible chain of democracies, it's a very strange way of defining democracy, and we might have another term to refer to those countries. Here in the Parliament, the Greens funded a study into intermediaries, the lawyers and accountants that sort of lubricate the process of, of tax avoidance and are central to the tax avoidance industry. We found that half the intermediaries operating in Europe come from just two countries. The UK is the first, as you can see on the graphic there, with 27% of them, followed by Switzerland. And you can also see that other key parts of the UK tax haven network are, are important players in terms of the intermediaries. So that's kind of like, in a way, the bit of the iceberg that's above the water, but there's also a very unpleasant underbelly to this network of political actors in terms of the um, tax avoidance industry in Britain. So you may have heard of the Taxpayers Alliance. I should start by saying it's not an alliance of taxpayers. It's not a membership organisation. It's a fake think tank funded by dark money, which has very close links with similar right-wing organisations across the Atlantic. In 2010, it hosted an event sponsored by the US Tea Party organization, which in many ways can be seen as a forerunner of Trump's political movement. Funding was also provided by Americans for the Americans for Prosperity Foundation, 
you can look some of these up later, but don't do it late at night because it'll keep you up. Also, the, the, the far-right Koch brothers are major donors to that foundation. There's also the Cato Institute, no relation to me, obviously, and the Heritage Foundation. The TPA, the Taxpayers' Alliance, is also a member of the Atlas Network, which is a kind of global network of wealthy men who want to control their own money and not have democracy intervening in their lives. The Taxpayers' Alliance was also set up by Matthew Elliott, who left it to become the chief executive officer of Vote Leave, the official, the official Brexit campaign and an organisation that's now under investigation by the National Crime Agency. So these are the plans that the Taxpayers' Alliance have in store for Britain if we go ahead with Brexit. They, based, they were operating according to the disaster capitalist mantra of never waste a good crisis. So they immediately went into full-on policy mode. They suggested cutting corporation tax all the way down to 10%, scrapping the 45p rate of income tax, and temporarily cutting VAT to 17.5%. Incredibly, in spite of their very strongly politically oriented activity, they are still registered as a charity in the UK. So let's move on now to the even more dodgy and unseemly aspects of Brexit, and this is the Russian connection. Of course, it's very difficult to know what's happening um, in terms of Russian influence on Brexit, but we do have quite a good idea about the, the way um, Russian oligarchs use the city of London to, to invest their dirty money by buying property. Global Witness have found that more than, seven times, more than seven times more money flowed from Russia to the overseas territories than has gone to the UK itself, and it accounts for 12% of all the money invested outside Russia. Just one example is a British Virgin Island company linked to the Russian government that sent $900,000 to another British Virgin Islands company owned by Russian oligarch Alexander Perepilichny, I think it must be, who was later found to have ties with Syria's chemical weapons program. The owner of the first company fled to the UK where he died in suspicious circumstances. Up to 14 Russian oligarchs have been murdered on UK soil, and most the, the, the most prominent one is the attack in Salisbury, which I represent. So four people I represent were po poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok, and one of them later died. So a couple of the, the sort of leading Russian oligarchs in Britain, firstly Roman Abramovich, who is worth an estimated nine billion, makes his home in, in London. And there's also Oleg Deripaska, who had strong political connections in the UK and still does actually, and is now under US sanctions. So essentially, I mean, the next slide illustrates, this is the FT's view of um, what's going on. You know, the, the city of London's approach to oligarchs is craven. Effectively, we've prostituted ourselves in the UK to the wealth of Russian oligarchs, and we've ignored the filth and the crime that comes with it. There's also a strong connection here with the um, bad boys of Brexit. So quite a few have met with Russian officials or Russian spies. The Russian ambassador in London, Alexander Vladimirovich Yakovenko, has a close relationship with Aaron Banks, and, is, and they have a sort of very close relationship on, tweet, on Twitter where you see them retweeting each other's tweets. Matthew Elliott, who I referred to earlier, who headed up the Leave, the Vote Leave campaign, was a central member of Conservative Friends of Russia, which has been reported to have been used as a means for Russia to influence conservative politicians. And their key contact at the Russian embassy was called Sergei Nalabin, and he was later expelled from Britain as a suspected Russian spy. Then we have the Russian connection of Aaron Banks himself. His Russian wife, Katya, who used to be called Yekaterina Padarinas, was suspected by special branch of working for the Russian government. She was narrowly, she narrowly avoided being deported, and at this point, a Liberal Democrat MP intervened on her behalf, and he was um, later suspected of espionage and um, under investigation by MI5, our security services. So, I mean, the question is, why is Brexit going ahead when all of this is... Um, out there in the public domain. Everything I've told you is in the public domain. What we really need is to know a lot more, particularly about the Russian connection, because what is going on there is known to the security services. And essentially the reason is that our politicians have benefited from Russian money and they have absolutely no interest in investigating either the past of uh, Russian collusion in Brexit or what might be happening right now. It would be politically embarrassing, and it would also mean them having to give a lot of money back. March, just last year, 2018, the Conservative Party announced that it would not be handing back 
pounds in donations they had received from Russian oligarchs and their associates. The Chancellor said it would be wrong to tar them with Putin's brush. Well, if you know anything about the way the Russian state works, you know that the, you know it's, it's a complete network of oligarchs and Putin working close in hand. So this is the, the question that we should end on. Why do we not have a Mueller-style investigation in the UK? And um, I think it's important that we consider these political motivations before we hear more detailed information about the possibility of expanding the British tax haven after Brexit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Molly, for this uh, intervention. Uh, I would also also only introduce myself. My name is František Nejedli. I'm a tax justice campaigner for the Greens FA group in the European Parliament, and I will sort of coordinate this uh, uh, part of discussion and, and also uh, the second part uh, of uh, today's afternoon. I uh, would uh, not speak uh, too much uh, because I want more to listen to you and we have excellent uh, speakers today. So I would uh, directly ask uh, Mr. John Christensen, who is director of the Tech Justice Network, uh, on his opinion, uh, what are the main challenges and risks that are connected to Brexit vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the future of tax havens? And, uh, of course, maybe also what would be your recommendations to the UK and also to us, uh, to the EU, uh, what uh, should we do? Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, I share um, your view, Molly, about the dark origins of Brexit, um, because when I started looking at uh, what was happening um, immediately after the uh, the referendum result in June 2016, it became absolutely clear to me that um, many people in the city um, suspected that parts of the city were involved in this. Um, but for them, for the City of London, the Brexit result came as a complete surprise. They welcomed a distraction, a major political distraction from the attention that was being paid at that time to strengthening regulation, financial services and so on. But they certainly did not expect this result, and in many respects, this result was a was a catastrophe for them. Um, and uh, they kind of assumed that they would be able to continue a working relationship, that is, to trade within the single market, pretty much as before, on the basis of passporting rights. And for the first uh, 12 months or so, that's what I heard from everyone I spoke to in the city. They were saying, we will get passporting rights. We will have that relationship with Europe. It became clear, however, in 2017 that that wasn't going to continue. Uh, and um, they started to, to focus on something else. They started to say, we will negotiate equivalents that, that we will expect to be able to continue to trade financial services within Europe on the basis of equivalence. I want to talk about equivalence and I want to talk about what kind of conditions Europe should be imposing upon a post-Brexit London or, or Britain before they even begin to consider giving British banks or banks trading out of London and other financial services organisations trading out of London equivalence access to the European market. Um, next slide, please. Um, Molly has already raised the issue of uh, the, the kind of development strategy that Britain has been talking about, or the key players. Here you have both the finance minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, and Theresa May, Prime Minister, talking about the possibility of a, of a, a Singapore upon the Thames development model. They're not alone. Next slide, please. More recently, we've had the Home Secretary, um, Sabi Javid, um, and the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, both talking about a Singapore on the Thames development strategy. They are not talking about Singapore's um, housing policies, which is largely driven by public sector housing, or, or education, or indeed health services they're talking about a very toxic version of Singapore. And Mr. Javid uh, is reported as having spoken very recently to, to a, a Conservative Party uh, meeting. And what he has in mind when he talks about Singapore on the Thames is a commitment to sweeping tax cuts on corporation tax and tax cuts on mobile rich people, 
using tax wars as a weapon against Europe and the rest of the world. He talks about giving tax measures, deeper tax measures, for example, accelerated capital allowances to attract mobile investments to the UK. He talks about comprehensive deregulation of financial services, removal of social protections, and removal of environmental protections. He talks about, I mean, he's prepared to completely accept weak or non-existence compliance with international anti-money laundering re regulations. He talks about extending, deepening golden visa arrangements to offer resident rights to wealthy non-British citizens uh, who want to, to establish residence in the UK, which increases, will actually deepen Britain's exposure to illicit financial flows. Next slide, please. Of course, none of this is new. Since the 1950s, Britain has been deeply committed to a tax haven development strategy. In the mid-1950s, it opened up the euro dollar market uh, to, to welcome largely petrodollars at that stage into UK. Interestingly, Russian money started flowing immediately out of the Soviet Union into London. Um, and um, this has been the development strategy that UK, by and large, has, has pursued since the 1950s and deepening further through financial regulation, deregulation since the 1980s. I'd argue that the scale of risks that tax haven Britain imposes on other countries needs to be fully, more fully explored. And I want to talk a bit about the recent spillover analysis conducted by a research team in Britain, led by Andrew Baker, at, uh, Professor Andrew Baker at the Sheffield Political Economic Research Institute, and Professor Richard Murphy, I think many of you will know of Richard Murphy's work at City University. And when they look at Britain's, the risks Britain imposes and could expose you, Europe too, they identify the use of competitive cutting of corporate income tax rates. They're committed to having the lowest rate amongst G20 countries, accompanied by favouring of territorial taxation arrangements to encourage profit shifting to tax havens. Of course, Britain introduced patent box facilities, has extraordinarily relaxed control of foreign corporation rules, and it uses special facilities to encourage location of com company treasury operations to its tax havens. But it goes deeper than that. Britain has a long-term policy of attracting oligarchs and dirty money by providing these oligarchs with uh, a, a special treatment under the non-domicile rule, which undermines both the corporate income tax rate and the personal income tax rate of tax bases across the entire world. This makes Britain an extremely attractive haven for high net worth individuals and ultra high net wealth individuals, and of course exposes it to dirty money flows. Notwithstanding the commitment that David Cameron as Prime Minister made to making company ownership information available on public registry, anyone who ever looks or uses the, the UK company registry will know that the information on that registry is largely uh, inaccurate, out of date, um, and the, the registry itself is under-resourced, so the information um, is incomplete. And that presents us with major barrier to, to investigation. Um, they also identify in their spillover analysis that company and trust administration practices in the UK and its tax haven dependencies threaten the integrity of third party country tax regimes because they fail to accurately identify the beneficial owners of the companies that are registered there. They don't comply with or enforce delivery of accounting data and they don't require adequate disclosure of company trading data. All of that makes Britain a deep secrecy jurisdiction, even though it has a nominally uh, public register. And in pra practice, British arrangements undermine the tax regimes of other countries by not requiring companies incorporated in the UK, but which claim to be trading in, third, in other countries and not in the UK, to submit annual tax returns. And that also creates a dark spot for anyone investigating how profits are being shifted from one country to another. Now, crucially, Britain has a large, I call it a web, a large web, a spider's web of tax havens, overseas territories and crown dependencies across the world. And these are not independent territories. They are politically very closely linked to Britain. Britain has complete political control over them, argues that it doesn't, but that is not the case. And these jurisdictions act as an ecosystem in a vertically integrated way to block information exchange processes 
and to undermine international cooperation on tackling money laundering. So next slide, please. Looked at in isolation, Molly's already referred to the Financial Secrecy Index, here are Britain's territories. And I argue you cannot look at them, look at UK, which interestingly has quite a good score, 42 on the Financial Secrecy score. That's a secrecy score, 42, that puts it in what we regard as a non-dangerous zone. Don't look at it in isolation. It has to be looked at as, a, as an ecosystem which includes the Isle of Man, Jersey and British Virgin Islands, which are heading into the danger zone, and then look at Gibraltar, Cayman Islands, Guernsey, Bermuda, and the Turks and Caicos, all of which are in the dangerous danger zone. My view is that you should look at Britain taken as a whole, including its tax havens, and judge it by the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator here is the Turks and Caicos Islands. Secrecy score of 77. Collectively, this web provides a complex and evolving ecosystem of laws, regulations and regulatory non-compliance, which undermines tax transparency and undermines regulation of financial services across the world, and obviously has undermined, continues to undermine anti-money laundering uh, legislation. Next slide, please. Of course, none of this actually happens by accident. Um, London has always done its dirty, like to do its dirty uh, business offshore in places like Gibraltar, Cayman uh, uh, and uh, Turks and Caicos. And despite all the promises to be transparent and cooperative, British, Britain's offshore secrecy jurisdictions have absolutely refused to make their company registries open to public scrutiny. And some have even threatened to secede from the UK if this is forced upon them. You just click down to the next part of this slide. I was fascinated. No, no, not, not previous. That's the one. I was interested by when I read this in the Guardian very recently about the threats to secede. These, these are not new. Back in the 18th century, in the 19th century, when Britain started to, to attempt to close down its slave economy in the Caribbean, guess what happened on exactly the same islands? They threatened to secede from Britain. If you tried to close down our slave economy, we will leave you. And they even talked about joining up with the United States in this process. So what's to be done about Britain's potential withdrawal from the European Union? I think that the European Union needs to take very strong measures to protect itself from tax haven Britain. The implication of the Prime Minister's threat of a Singapore and the Thames strategy is that London will con continue with its weak anti-money laundering regime and its support of offshore secrecy and it will continue to, to attract dirty money from across the world. And its satellite secrecy jurisdictions, the Caymans and so on, will continue to resist measures to strengthen international cooperation and to make offshore companies and trusts more transparent. And the UK government will be complicit with this refusal to cooperate. Next slide, please. In this circumstance, it seems foolhardy for the, United, the European Union to give the City of London, or rather to give the United Kingdom what the City of London wants, which is equivalence, equivalent treatment um, of its regulation compared to regulation within the European Union itself. Um, equivalence, as you can see here, it's a relatively new concept. It's, it, it's a kind of mutual recognition of standards. Interestingly and importantly, it doesn't require both standards, both sides to harmonise on rules and regulations. Also importantly, it does leave a little bit of room for, for standing back. And, and in fact, for revo revo the, the equivalence can be revoked on 30 days notice. And that's very important because that gives the European Union bargaining power over the United Kingdom. My principle, I have two main recommendations. The first is that the European Union should, before even entering, considering giving the United Kingdom equivalence, equivalent treatment for financial services in a post-Brexit Britain, you should require a comprehensive spillover analysis commissioned from an independent body. Don't look to the Financial Action Task Force. Don't look to any body which can be manipulated politically, as we've seen with the blacklisting processes. Look to independent academic experts um, and ask them to provide a comprehensive spillover analysis 
of not just the UK, but the entirety of the UK tax haven ecosystem, including Turks and Caicos, including Cayman and so on, and treat it as a single ecosystem and judge it accordingly and say that you can have equivalence subject to you, you bringing all of these territories up to the standards that we require. And that will mean Britain being forced to impose public registries for trusts and companies onto all of its overseas territories. This spillover analysis should inform any decision by the European Union regarding recognition of equivalence of regulation. And until such time as the UK government imposes on all its dependencies, full transparency stand standards, recognition of equivalence should be withheld from all financial services, all financial services. And if need be, and if UK ducks out and goes for a full WTO um, no deal type arrangement, that will be a crisis, an existential crisis for, for um, the financial services in London, because the majority of the services they market into the European Uni Union fall under WTO mode three arrangements. And that will require them to operate via commercial establishment within the single market. So they'll have to transfer from London to Frankfurt or Amsterdam or Paris. So this is a very powerful tool you have available to you. Now, my second recommendation, and I'm sure Eva would, would totally agree with this one, because we discussed at lunch, is you must, the European Commission must proceed with its common consolidated corporate tax-based project. It must move forward with, a, with a, a, a tax system based on apportionment of profits to the countries where they are genuinely created. But not only must it establish a common standard for the tax, aver, for the tax base to protect uh, individual men, member states from predatory actions of spoiler states like the UK. The common, it will also require a common tax base underpinned by a, an agreed minimum rate. Uh, Eva was talking about 20%, I think 25% is, uh, is uh, what I would like to go for, to block the kind of race to the bottom tactics that the UK is signaling it plans to adopt. Final word, the threat of a post-Brexit Singapore and the Thames places Europe and I think the rest of the world at a point in our political evolution which must, where we must choose between committing to deeper cooperation, for example, through a common corporate tax base underpinned by a minimum tax rate, or whether to follow through on the current trajectory, which is a race to the bottom on both tax rates and on regulatory standards. If we follow the latter, inevitably we'll have slower growth increased financial market volatility, deeper inequality, social division. So it seems to me a no-brainer which route Europe must take. Thanks, Mr. Chair, for the, uh, for the floor. Thank you for this, <clears throat> for this uh, excellent, excellent input. Of course, there's a question how, or it seems that uh, taking back control could meant really totally different slogan uh, or motto than uh, than it um, uh, that it seemed. Uh, so I would have a similar question for Oliver Pierce uh, of Ox from Oxfam. Uh, so do you think uh, after Brexit the UK will become a, a tax haven, or uh, what do you expect uh, will will happen, and uh, what risks what risks do you see? And of course, uh, what are your ideas uh, on the possible remedies? Thank you. My short answer is yes, I do <laughs> see those risks and I concur with pretty much everything my colleagues have already said. There is a significant risk that from the signals we've already seen that post Brexit, the United Kingdom, in combination with its overseas territories, crown dependencies and the facilitators of tax dodging based in the city of London seek to advance a race to the bottom on corporate tax, but also more widely on regulation and try to depend even more on financial services, which as John pointed out, is likely to lead to greater volatility and greater inequality. Oxfam's concerned about these kinds of issues, primarily because of the impact 
of such a race to the bottom has on developing countries. Developing countries rely, on average, for about twice as much of their overall tax revenues from corporate taxes as do OECD countries. And therefore, when we're talking about a race to the bottom on corporate tax rates, when we're talking about tax incentives and countries, as John put it, at war with each other uh, by using tax competition, that race to the bottom disadvantages developing countries the most. And given the impact that the UK can have in concert with its overseas territories and crown dependencies, the risk for uh, sort of being cut loose and pursuing a different model, I think, should worry those of us who are concerned about instilling progressive tax systems for, from corporate tax and from other kinds of taxes, because we all depend on the public services that those kinds of taxes help pay for, whether we live in developed or developing countries. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the same issues that Molly and John have covered so articulately, but I want to try and bring through not only the impact of the possibility of the UK becoming more like a tax haven post-Brexit, not only on the EU, but also on other countries, particularly developing countries. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, the first point is to underscore really what John and Molly have already said, that we need to think about the totality of the UK financial sector. And that means encompassing the 14 overseas territories, some of which are pretty notorious tax havens and the three crown dependencies. John mentioned the uh, Tax Justice Network Financial Secrecy Index, and so did Molly, um, Oxfam's analysis has focused more on corporate tax havens, but there's a great deal of overlap in our analysis. For example, when we released a study a couple of years ago called Tax Battles, we tried to rank corporate tax havens. And the one that came out on top using the indicators that we applied was Bermuda. Um, in the top 15, we also had the Cayman Islands, Jersey, and the British Virgin Islands making that top 15 list. So we think that uh, whether you look at financial secrecy or whether you look at tax havens allowing corporate tax dodging, overseas territories and crown dependencies are highly implicated. One example of that that we're likely to be quite familiar with in the wake of the Panama Papers is the prevalence of the British Virgin Islands. The companies exposed in the Panama Papers, over half of them were registered in that small jurisdiction. It was apparently the go-to jurisdiction for Mossack Fonseca, despite Mossack Fonseca being registered in another tax haven in Panama itself. And we know from the research that... Uh, Eva and Molly alluded to by Gabrielle Zuckman that tax havens are sinks collecting and passing on uh, large financial flows from corporates, but they are also used by individuals. Using Gabrielle Zuckman's analysis, we reckon at Oxfam that developing countries are losing out on something in the order of $70 billion every year because wealthy individuals are able to essentially hide their wealth untaxed in low or no zero, low or no uh, tax rate jurisdictions rather than that wealth being properly taxed in developing countries. That's in addition to the massive corporate tax avoidance that the same kind of tax havens facilitate. And for developing countries, the United Nations is maybe a little bit out of date now, but one of the better estimates out there is that at least $100 billion every year is routed through tax havens, apparently to invest in third countries, that enables companies to avoid 
paying that tax in developing countries. So putting those two together, you have about $170 billion uh, of tax avoidance through these kinds of tax havens. Not only UK ones in this case, but the UK ones are central to it. In addition to the tax havens themselves, we know that, as we've already heard, the City of London is home to many of the facilitators of tax dodging, whether that be accountants, lawyers, or other professional service firms. And London itself, the United Kingdom, is one of the biggest what has been called conduit financial centres. So a lot of financial flows come through London, often on their way, ultimately, to tax havens so that they can be lightly or indeed avoid tax altogether. The IMF, uh, in a recent study, shows that almost 40% of these kinds of financial flows are essentially artificial in that they're rooted through tax havens or financial centres in order to avoid tax that should be paid. They're not actually being invested in those places, they're just rooting through them. Um, but in addition to the UK and its overseas territories and crown dependencies helping to facilitate tax dodging, they're also in policy terms helping to drive a race to the bottom. And we can see this in one way through the nominal rates applied in different jurisdictions. Uh, the UK has quite savagely cut its headline corporate income tax rate since 2010. It now stands at 19%. It's due to go to 17% by 2020. And we've heard that quite publicly there are strong advocates within government calling for it to be cut further. This is against the backdrop of a global trend that has seen the headline corporate income tax rate fall from, well, around about 40% if you go back to 1990, but more recently around 30%, but it's now in the order of 25%. And whilst the UK has been cutting very drastically, that trend has also been witnessed in other EU countries. And of course, when we look at the nominal tax rates of many of the overseas territories and crown dependencies, they in many cases apply uh, a rate of 0%. What's really interesting, though, is that we have to look beyond the headline rates. And, and as the study released today shows, we, we have to understand what the effective tax rates paid by particularly multinationals are. And in some cases, um, even where tax havens have nominal rates above zero, the actual rates paid by many companies is close to zero. That applies to some tax havens, by the way, inside the EU. Uh, we've heard one or two mentioned already. The Netherlands might be another one we, we want to talk about there. But what's the impact of the UK and its overseas territories and crown dependencies? Well, first of all, it's about that race on the nominal uh, headline rates. But secondly, it's about the lobbying to enable countries to re retain that supposed sovereignty to keep cutting rates. We think there might be a new round of international discussions following up from the OECD base erosion and profit shifting project. One of the things that should be foremost on that agenda is some kind of flaw under corporate tax rates, whether that's at the nominal level and or on effective rates. We are particularly concerned that in any negotiations, the UK government has been quite clear so far in saying, that countries should not have to sign up to anything that requires uh, a flaw under nominal rates. And that rather makes a mockery of trying to address this problem with the race to the bottom. We know that if we just look at effective tax rates, the BEPS process, it seems, hasn't succeeded. Effective tax rates in many cases are lower now than they were yeah. at the start of the financial crisis. They're lower even than at the start of uh, the BEPS project. So while some loopholes may have been addressed, 
new ones have been opened up or new ones are there by design almost. One last aspect of the UK's tax policy that we should uh, be wary of as we talk about Brexit is its tax treaty network. And this chart actually comes from an EU publication, a European Commission survey of tax policies in member states. And it uses a kind of um, centrality index to identify which countries are seen as having the most attractive tax treaties uh, for companies to essentially gain one jurisdiction against another and take advantage of tax treaties to reduce their liabilities on a global basis. So we can see that the UK is already preeminent <laughs> in this rather dubious leaderboard. And where there's even greater uh, capacity on the part of the UK to strike out a loan, one would expect this kind of uh, approach to be taken more. So what can be done about this? Um, John's already mentioned spillover analysis, and I do think that uh, conducting rigorous independent spillover analysis could be something that the EU could look at. It could do so, for instance, in conjunction with the existing blacklist. It could do so as part of uh, withdrawal agreement or trade agreement negotiations. But I think, as John said, the, the key thing is to make sure that such an analysis is holistic and understands the totality of the UK alongside its crown dependencies and overseas territories and tries to find a way to look at how policies work uh, in law, so looking at the headline rate of corporate income tax, for example, but also in practice, how uh, incentives such as the patent box or other sort of giveaways can be factored into such spillover analysis. And what, <coughs> crucially, is the impact on other countries' policy-making decisions. The blacklist itself could be a tool that the EU looks to use perhaps uh, more directly with overseas territories and crown dependencies. We know, for instance, that there are seven listed on the grey list. We expect, on the basis of the current EU uh, process, that those will be <laughs> essentially given a clean bill of health because the relevant territories have um, instituted some legal changes to require companies doing business there to have some substance. But firstly, the threshold of those substance requirements is so low that you would think that for any large company, it will simply be seen as a cost of doing business. And secondly, there are probably more direct ways that we can ensure substance. One would be an agreement on a minimum effective tax rate or something like that. So using the existing tools, but perhaps in a more direct way, is something that could be considered. Perhaps, given the agreement or the anti-money laundering directive to require public registers of beneficial ownership, the EU too could have that as one of its criteria. And that would be one way to, uh, to cajole or <laughs> make sure that the UK's overseas territories and Crown dependencies implement that measure. The UK government has legislated, rather unwillingly, for that measure to be adopted by the overseas territories. But recently, it's become clear that they're going to give those territories a pretty long run-in to implement those. And therefore, more third-party pressure uh, would no doubt be welcome. The very fact that the EU, through its blacklist process, has ensured that countries have changed its law does show that such tools, whatever their weaknesses, can have impacts on third countries. And the last point that I would make is that um, the EU should look, whether it's through treaty negotiations or other tools, to ensure how its progress on developing fair tax policies within the EU can be strengthened, first of all, but also how it can be used to ensure that third party countries adopt equivalent standards. So whether it's putting a floor under corporate tax, having a minimum effective tax rate, having common CFC rules which are applied 
um, there are a range of options that the EU can and should be looking at, not only in relation to Brexit, but in relation to a race to the top globally. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for this uh, um, intervention and, and the ideas that I think we should be definitely thinking about to take on board in the EU. Uh, I uh, would like to now to uh, pass the floor uh, to you for questions because uh, we have around 15 minutes that we can uh, use for uh, Q&As now. So I would uh, always like to ask you to uh, introduce yourself uh, at uh, to really ask a question with a question mark, uh, ideally. And uh, so, please, who would like to uh, take the floor? Thank you. If there is no one, then I would try to kick uh, the ball first uh, and I would have a question for our uh, speakers because of course what you presented it's uh, it's clear that uh, there uh, are uh, some actors that uh, want to use or aim to use the Brexit uh, for uh, their economic interests and uh, of course to perhaps use it also to uh, strengthening the opportunities for tax evasion, tax avoidance, perhaps even money laundering. Uh, my, my question is, um, of course, the, this will not uh, impact only Europe, but also uh, British citizens. And is there a, a strong debate on this in the UK in the context of Brexit? And what are the what are the what is the opinion of uh, uh, British citizens? Because I think that uh, we know uh, from the past that there was there were figures showing how much paid different companies, uh, uh, basically less than uh, <laughs> uh, one Brit, and so on. So, what is your opinion of this, and how do you see this uh, debate in the UK developing? I'll do a bit on the politics of this. Um, I mean, the main thing to realise about the UK is that we're totally mired in, in Brexit, just day-to-day -day Brexit kind of pantomime, really, and theatre, and it sidelines almost everything else. So the report that we released today, which shows the difference between the effective tax rate and the nominal tax rate, which shows a, a, you know, a considerable difference in the case of the UK, was barely reported. In fact, it wasn't picked up by anybody. It was widely reported across Europe, but not in the UK, because essentially a lot of the media outlets have sacked the people that would have been working on this to transfer them to work on Brexit, and the whole of the kind of British psyche is, is doing that at the moment. And I'd also have to add that if you look at the, the website, the Brexit Syndicate, you'll see the news organisations and who's paying for them in Britain. So we have very concentrated media ownership, uh, very few outlets that are not owned by wealthy people. The, all the outlets I'm talking about lose money. You know, best example is probably the Barclay Brothers, who live in which island? I always forget. Breku. There we are, Breku, one of the Channel Islands. Um, tax exiles, they own the Telegraph and the Spectator, which are driving this Brexit agenda and driving the, the tax avoidance um, agenda as well. So um, the debate is incredibly poorly informed and part of the lack of democracy, the reason we've seen Brexit, but also the reason people don't understand that they're incredibly disgruntled because they know they're getting poorer. They don't understand why, because they're reading nonsense in newspapers owned by you know, wealthy tycoons who are just driving a particular far-right agenda. If I can just add to that, one of the extraordinary things about the discussion is there seems to be a kind of recognition uh, in Parliament that financial services are important in this context, but I have seen virtually no discussion in the UK press about what kind of arrangements there will be between 
Europe, uh, the, uh, that is the, the member states and, and Britain. The FT has covered it occasionally, um, reasonably well. They've investigated passporting rights. They've investigated the whole issue of equivalence. They've investigated and looked at how a WTO arrangement would impact the city, and they've, you know, they recognise that there's a, an existential crisis. I held a seminar, seminar <clears throat> in early 2017 at City University with senior people from across the City of London, and what was extraordinary for me was that virtually none of them had realised that passport rights would not be automatically granted. They kind of blagged about it. Yeah, we'll be able to blag passporting rights. That is, for those of you not familiar with the term blag, <laughs> we'll be able to somehow negotiate our way through with this one way on one way or the other with uh, Michel Barnier and his team. So we'll be able to cheat our way into getting passport rights. When they were told that that wasn't the case and when they were told that a no deal under WTO might actually mean that all their services would fall under under mode three WTO arrangements, they kind of went into hysterical mode and said, this cannot happen. We've got to reverse the referendum. Yes. Um, but th this discussion just hasn't happened in any kind of systematic way within Britain. And I find that's quite extraordinary because the British public know next to nothing about this. They still seem to think that the city of London is the golden goose in the British economy. I argue the exact opposite. I argue that it's a cuckoo in the nest and Britain suffers from a finance curse. But um, there's been virtually no public discussion or informed discussion within Parliament about what kind of negotiation Theresa May is aiming at um, with, through a current uh, agreement. Unbelievable. Yeah. Eva said unbelievable. It is unbelievable. <laughs> I would just add that on the broader policy debate, even putting aside the myopia surrounding Brexit, there isn't a very clear and certainly not very informed public debate about how we raise tax revenues progressively and what we're using them for. One example is around corporate tax. It's kind of taken as a given in public debate that in order to be competitive, whatever that means, corporate tax rates need to be low and need to stay lower than our competitors. And that if that has an impact on tax revenues, we will just have to make that up somewhere else. Yet, at the same time, we know that there is significant public outrage about corporate and individual tax avoidance. The polling is consistent on this. And it's strange that the same newspapers that trumpet a deregulated low tax economy are also quite fond of sticking the boot in to companies when they decide that the latest tax returns of a particular company don't look very good. So even some of those newspapers that Molly talked about um, will have a go at their companies and say it's outrageous, but they don't join up this public debate to make it more informed. Sorry, Chairman, can I just quickly come back on that? Uh, I was talking about that with um, the editor of a fairly well-known newspaper recently in Britain, and he said, yeah, every time we put the boot into a company, they know that if they increase their advertising with us, we'll stop highlighting their tax avoidance. <laughs> Seems incredible, but that's the dynamic. Simon, I'm not sure whether you come across this, but uh, yeah, the the, the uh, companies which um, uh, have been highlighted have generally increased their, <laughs> their advertising revenue in order to discourage this kind of bad publicity. Thanks a lot. I would uh, well ask you again if you would have uh, any questions. Please don't be shy. Um, Yes, <laughs> thank you. I, I had a question. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm curious about, um, I, I'm from the UK, I'm representing ICIJ here, an international organisation, but I live in the UK, and I, so I'm asking sort of as an audience uh, participant in this sec section, um, what, what's, the, um, uh, what's the sense of what the, the, the thinking on the left 
uh, about Brexit. The, the, the pro-Brexit um, people on the left, how do they reconcile um, the, uh, the, the, the seemingly inexorable slide towards uh, uh, intensified tax competition with their, their, their goals? It's, it's, I, I don't get that, and I just wondered if you could explain how someone who believes in progressive taxation might be opposed to Brexit, because there are those people out there. I feel almost inclined to not answer the question because I've kind of given up engaging with those people because they're not in a rational space and it just becomes incredibly frustrating. I mean, um, it works a bit like this. If you think the most important thing is getting Jeremy Corbyn into number 10, then clearly everything he says is correct. Therefore, if he has a critique of the EU based around misguided idea about state aid, then you support him in that. And therefore, you know, um, you just have to deny the usefulness of the measures that the EU is taking on tax. So it works from an emotional impulse towards Jeremy Corbyn, towards rationally ignoring the fact that the EU is still the best place for tax policy in the world. So um, like a lot of the Brexit discussions, if you're trying to have a rational argument, you just end up getting frustrated, in my experience. I've had quite a lot of experience of that too. So thank you. Uh, well, if there are, again, I could ask you if there are any more questions, but if, if there are no questions at the moment, then, I would call for a five-minute five break. I would thank to our speakers on this first uh, part of the discussion. And uh, we would have uh, a short break and then we would discuss more about the policies with, with Simon Bowers and also with Sven Giegold who arrived and uh, most speakers. So in, in five minutes we would start again. Thank you. Uh, for the second panel of our today's debate, we wanted to look about look look a bit on what actually happened uh, in the past five years, because with uh, the revelations such as the Panama Papers, the, Par the Paradise Papers, there has been a strong political momentum to uh, war and treasons for. To work on a tax justice connected agenda and of course uh, this political momentum have been translated in concrete policies and proposals uh, but of course not all of them are uh, yet finished uh, or uh, completed so in this debate we would also like to uh, look a bit into the future what uh, should be the next or what are the next fights uh, on tax justice that not only this parliament but our societies will need to uh, will need to have? So I would shortly introduce you to our speakers. First, uh, please welcome uh, Laure Briot, uh, policy officer, officer of Transparency International in Brussels, who is spe who is spe specialized on. Uh, particularly transparency and money, money, anti-money laundering policies. Uh, also, please uh, welcome Mr. Simon Bowers, who's uh, ICIJ reporter uh, and, coordinator, and ICIJ coordinator for Europe, who participated in uh, the investigations and revelations such as Panama Papers or the Paradise Papers. And uh, for... Uh, Greens EFA group, please uh, uh, welcome our MEP Sven Giegold, who is uh, our coordinator in Econ Committee and in Tax Tree Committee uh, that works on the tax issues. So please, uh, without uh, any lengthy introductions, I would like to pass the floor to Simon Bowers to uh, give us his experience and uh, reflections uh, from what he, as a journalist, investigated and worked on. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, yeah, I'm from International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, and unlike a lot of other people on the panel, I'm not NGO, I'm not a politician. I don't come here with uh, grand ideas about how things can be solved. I only come here to say what the problems I've tripped over have 
undiscovered and reported upon. So um, in many ways, you know, my contribution is, is limited, but I, 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 I like to think that uh, journalism has played some role in helping uh, this debate forward. Um, and uh, I will start by just, just, just telling you one example, which is uh, ha there, there's some recent, recent developments on which uh, concerns um, a company that you will know well called um, uh, Nike. I wonder if we go next slide. Yeah. So this is a receipt. Um, let, let me let me start start by telling you uh, this. This relates to um, Paradise Papers, one of our our leaks, and we had um, uh, we had a very small amount of information about Nike's operations in uh, Bermuda, and we couldn't really make head or tail of them. And it, we were on the on the cusp of, of of ditching that line of inquiry. There was 1.4 terabytes of data in that in that leak. And we had to move on. Um, but before we did that, I decided to go out and buy a pair of running shoes. This is the receipt, and uh, we studied it. We studied it carefully, and you can see on the back of the receipt, which is printed on the right, there is an address, and the address is an address in the UK, uh, and there's a there's a, a registration number. But that that company, uh, it says Nike Retail UK. Nike Retail UK is not. A UK company, you won't find it on UK company registry. It is a it is the name that a Dutch company uses when it trades in the UK, uh, and 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 th this 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 was the beginnings of a money trail that we that that we uh, began to uh, pull away at, and we this go, uh, we had reporters across Europe go out and buy running shoes, and they too found that on the back of the receipts, there was a, a confusing uh, a name that they couldn't find. And it, uh, they too found that they had bought from a Dutch company. And all the, in fact, all, all Nike's uh, sales in Europe were being pulled in the Netherlands. And, and from the Netherlands, they were then pushed out into other subsidiaries uh, that, that didn't pay tax. They were un untaxable subsidiaries, first in, in Bermuda, and uh, which is where our, our our snippet of data that we first started with from our leak came, and later in a Dutch partnership, a carefully constructed one that didn't attract tax. And if we took, go to the next slide, uh, th that's what happened to Nike's effective tax rate. It went from pretty steady at 35% for many years. And then uh, in 2006, the, it, it falls off a cliff uh, down to 20, below 20% and never recovers. Never. That's a drop of, drop of 10%. Uh, uh, Mass is bad there, at uh, fifteen uh, percent, and uh, and uh, uh, no drops below twenty five percent. Yeah, so to be fair, a drop of ten percent, uh, and that's it. That, that when you're making billions of dollars a year, that's an enormous amount of tax that they're saving through this mechanism. And it's it's very clear if you have just have the next slide that this occurs when Nike receives a favourable tax deal in Europe. That's a, a direct quote from the CEO on a conference call. It's five days before Christmas, 2006, and uh, what we were ex extremely um, we, we we published this as part of our our um, Paradise Papers investigation at the end of 2017, and um, uh, you know it did it did did quite well. We were we were pleased with it, um, but um, uh, to our surprise, we, we, what we hadn't realised was that the the uh, European uh, Commission, uh, Commission of Vestager at the at the um, Competition uh, Commission uh, um, was watching closely, and and she has uh, um, uh, just last week uh, taken this up as a, as a, a, a case of illegal state aid, suspected illegal state aid. So um, we we are um, delighted with this, um, but. Um, well, obviously, it's yet to be yet to be found. So we will see where it goes. But this is this is just one example. Uh, this is the try. When we do this reporting, uh, we 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 find it's very engaging. I think someone mentioned earlier, people people uh, um, newspapers, even even um, those um, friendly to the tax competition agenda, they love this sort of like taking a, a big consumer name and. Uh, and slamming it for aggressive tax avoidance. So this this kind of thing hits that sweet spot. But it, it's it, it, that it's behaviour that is just um, pervasive. 
And what, what, one of the points we always try and stress is that this is, this is not um, a, a, um, an aberration. This, this, is, this is routine behavior. Not, Nike executives would be, um, would be hauled over the coals by the shareholders if they weren't doing this. And that, that's the kind of thing to, that we want to emphasize. Now, this, this is the, the, the structures that Nike was using, uh, um, uh, uh, called a, a hybrid entity, but it's a, it's a tax maneuver that, was, that is particularly targeted by, by um, the OECD in, in its reforms announced in 2015. And they are on the way out. They will be on the way out by 2020. There, there is this, similar to the double Irish, which you may have heard of in Ireland, uh, uh, um, and some of the manoeuvres that Apple were doing there, that, that, uh, some of those manoeuvres that, that they had in place, they are on the way out. And so um, the, the question is, um, should we all be slapping uh, um, um, the OECD and, and the politicians on the back and saying, job well done, move on? And I think um, that's where uh, things start to get problematic. Now, we heard earlier um, that um, Gabriel Zuckman's done a great piece of research looking at uh, the extent to which um, we, uh, uh, um, there has been no progress since, since, uh, um, since BEPS. Uh, but um, there is a problem. As a journalist, you know, I I'm looking at, I'm, I'm constantly looking for clues to see um, uh, what, What's really going on under the hood in these in these complicated tangles of of connected companies, and um, it's hard right now. And the reason it's hard is because um, BEPS is a staggered process. The reforms of BEPS take a long time to come in. And if you speak to someone at the OECD, they'll say, "Oh well, you know, it takes a long time." And uh, and BEP, uh, and whilst we've we've secured BEPS, it's it 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 won't bite until many years down the line, particularly in. in in jurisdictions like Ireland and, and the Netherlands, uh, they're committed to reform, but just not now. Uh, and and um, so the question becomes then, well, uh, where, how can I see? I, I spent many years looking for to work out the clues and the tells in the company data and where to find them around the world to, to, to build these stories like this story about Nike. And now that the, 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 the reforms have... Uh, uh, there's been plenty of reform, and it's and everything seems to be up in the air. And it's not just the BEPS reforms. The US have had major, major tax reforms with colossal repercussions around the world, and um, it's very hard to see where things are going. But I'll just take you to the next slide, which I think uh, I think is an important one because this is just a selection. You can go through um, uh, any of the um, the, the S and P. 500 you like, and uh, but these are some well-known companies that, that have kn known for tax um, uh, planning strategies, and this is what they're currently telling uh, their investors about. Um, the, 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 they do sort of um, future-looking projections for their effective tax rates uh, in the current financial year. They're obliged to do it under SEC rules, and you'll find this on um, the quarterly and analyst calls they, they're given regularly. And these are just a few that I picked out. And you'll see that they're all um, well, well below um, the, uh, um, the tax rates that you would expect. Th these are rates that ought to be a blended average of the rates that they're paying around the world. Uh, yeah, Apple is, is the most profitable company in the world. And it's saying it's going to pay about 15%. It's telling investors it's going to pay about 15% in tax this year. Uh, um, so, in, in many, we'll, we'll soon we'll soon find out how they're going to do that, or we may not find out how they're going to do that. But the, what what we see is that they're telling their investors that they are doing it, and I think I think that's a shortcut to say to to, to say um, that right now uh, um, Beps is not biting, um, and um, I just. Uh, uh, Take you on to um, the next slide, uh, which is, is, is sorry, slightly to repeat a, a point, but I, I, it just th this this argument that it's uh, that um, the impact of OECD's BEPS uh, um, process on corporate tax income uh, that there's a constant mantra you'll hear from the OECD, which is it's too early to tell what the impact is, and it, after a while it starts to look like this other very famous quote, which you may have heard before where the uh, Chinese premier is asked, um, what's the effect of the, the French Revolution on Western civilization? 
and he says, too early to tell. How long can the OECD go on yes. with that message? Okay. Next slide. Uh, now, credibility problem. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I shouldn't really say it. Uh, well, let's whisper. I'll say it in a whisper. Um, the, the, the commissioner, uh, um, Jean-Claude Juncker, is a, um, has, has been a sterling advert advocate of um, CCCTB as a, as a solution, and he has bristled in press conferences about some member states um, holding out against, um, against uh, um, uh, the, these kinds of reforms that would, would uh, take a lot of abuse out of the system. But he has a credibility problem, and uh, he is the man who, uh, who built the... the built the, the abusive regime. I mean, he transformed Luxembourg from a fading steel economy into this one, one of the wealthiest per capita nations in the world that it has these extraordinary office blocks full of um, letterbox companies. You, you, you rush from one to... Well, I mean, we, we've, we've had a, uh, reporters in our consortium have rushed from office to office, uh, knocking on doors, and the same sort of... Uh, janitor stroke manager figure uh, pops up and opens the door. It's it's like a, a, a French farce. It, it, it's it's quite extraordinary. Um, and um, uh, anyway, we w uh, we think that uh, uh, Juncker has a, had a has a credibility problem. And and some some years ago, uh, where, where are we now? It's two two years ago, we we um, uh, uh, came across these uh, cables. Um, from the uh, uh, um, German representatives to to the um, uh, Code of Conduct Committee, that's a committee that's within the European Union that's supposed to really um, uh, uh, um, wheedle out the most abusive um, behaviours uh, amongst member states. Uh, uh, it's effectively a club where where you sit around the table and go, look. You know, you, you're, you're really not not behaving like we, as we'd like. It was it was very um, uh, opaque, but um, uh, it was supposed to be the, the forum where that kind of behaviour could be wheedled out. But instead of behaving, uh, instead of a, a peer pressure to behave, um, there were figures like Juncker, Juncker in particular, who was uh, who saw. That, the, that, the, that that process was completely stymied by the unanimity requirements. And, and it's the unanimity requirements that, that, that he has spent so much, it's so, so much of his political uh, uh, career has, it, it has been built on um, blocking that tax reform and, and uh, Luxembourg has uh, flourished as a consequence. And the, the final slide, please. Uh, just this is a quote from that uh, article, and you can see uh, this is uh, a quoting from the, the, the. You can feel the frustration in the German uh, cables where they say Luxembourg representative, representatives said they would uh, fundamentally object to any proposal to publish arguments made by Luxembourg in the committee. By mm -hmm. the way, the arguments that were making in the committee were about uh, um, uh, how. The basic, the most obvious abuses needed to stay, and that. But it, Luxembourg, like Ireland, like many others, it, it, in their in their public utterances, they are that they 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 speak the language of uh, um, tax reforms and and a willingness uh, to progress. So they're really this for me. The reason I brought it up today, it's two years old, but it it, it feels like it it was a glimpse behind the veil. Uh, uh, to look at the, the, the true motives of, of, of these uh, sm typically smaller uh, member states and, and the powers that they have. And, and the, what, what a crying shame it is that um, there isn't the political appetite for um, uh, um, a, a qualified majority voting. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. I think that uh, you mentioned uh, quite an important issue as the transparency in the council and how to negotiations on legislation are being done in this part of uh, 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 in, in this part of uh, EU institutions uh, as uh, mentioning transparency uh, our next speaker uh, comes from transparency international that actually deals with transparency quite a lot indeed and uh, during last few past few years it wasn't only a question about uh, 
tax evasion and tax avoidance, but also uh, money laundering uh, in Europe has become a key issue. And uh, I would like to ask you what have been done in uh, those past years, how we developed and what is still to be done in this area, also connected to transparency. Ah, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm, I'm wearing the AML ads of Transparency International. So um, I will just look at the issue more from a, an AML perspective rather than uh, a tax perspective, but this is still relevant. Um, and I'll try to uh, um, illustrate first how money laundering could be facilitated by uh, the existence of tax havens and uh, slash secrecy jurisdictions. Um, so um, the, the trick is uh, what we call the concept called beneficial ownership. So the idea of just disguising of uh, b behind several layers of uh, um, trust and company offshore companies, shell companies, often incorporated in those tax haven of secrecy jurisdiction in order to disguise the identity of the ultimate real owners, which we call the beneficial owners. Um, so on this issue, the, the EU has, uh, has uh, made, uh, and that's not that often that we as uh, CSOs we, we recognize this, so we should do it, uh, has made like a major uh, leap forward um, in, uh, in the fight against money laundering by adopting the FIFA AML directive last year. Um, so this uh, directive uh, uh, establishes public access to beneficial ownership uh, data as a principle for companies and a number of, and uh, trust in certain, um, not all trust, but uh, um, certain types of trust. Um, and so this is a major, uh, major improvement uh, in the EU uh, in the EU policy framework. But it also sets the bar higher than any existing international standard. Um, so, uh, of course, as NGOs, we're never happy enough, and uh, we still uh, ask, uh, we, we still ask for more. Uh, so, there's still a number of loopholes remaining in this uh, in this directive. Uh, one of them is about the coverage of uh, of the of the directive of the of the of the new beneficial ownership registers, uh, which will only cover companies, domestic companies, and uh, trust. Uh, like uh, foreign trust as well, but not offshore trust. Uh, meaning that if you are a, a settler uh, that's uh, located outside the EU, um, you can just uh, avoid, even if the trust is operating in the EU, you can avoid registration. Uh, so this for us is a major loophole and is leaving a grey zone that could be used by uh, by criminals. The second loophole is about trust transparency because uh, uh, public full public access will only be granted for trusts that are uh, that have um, a controlling interest in foreign companies, um, and that would leave out a number of trusts, uh, as you can imagine. The other would only be uh, would only be. Um, the information for the others would only be uh, accessible uh, um, through legitimate, like if you can demonstrate a legitimate interest. And we've seen in the past, in the previous directive, that this notion of legitimate interest is a really ill defined uh, and um, vague concept that have been actually misinterpreted in some transposition of the fourth AML directive by some member states. For example, we've got Italy that uh, uh, would uh, define legitimate interest as, uh, as uh, people uh, that would be involved in legal proceedings with the company and would want to ask information on that company. So that's far from being full public access to the data uh, available for those registers. Um, so uh, the, the, the last loophole uh, I want to emphasize, well, like the one before last, would be uh, the lack of any guidance and specification, technical specification, regarding how this register should be built. And this is a major issue because uh, we've got 28 member states. With very most of the time, they're going to use uh, existing commercial registers to uh, um, to like and fill it in with with beneficial ownership data. And the, the directive forces the interconnectedness of this uh, of this register, which is a good thing because that's the only way this it, they can be they can uh, serve as useful and meaningful tool for fighting money laundering. You need to be able to cross-reference data. You need to be able to uh, 
to to um, to to do data mining, crush uh, crush data, and 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 just look for red flags. And this can only be done uh, if you can just cross reference uh, several sets of data, uh, European like at European level, but also at national level. Um, and there is no specification at all on on the technical side. Uh, uh, and what we've been calling for, and we just didn't get to this time, but for the next rounds, I might, might just. Uh, uh, open up again soon uh, is like to to have open data standards and like uh, make make sure that the member state adopt open data standards. Um, this would really help uh, just. Uh, uh, Go from like the Stone Age of uh, in the fight against mon money laundering to the to like a more a more sophisticated system that's up to the level of what uh, what what criminals currently used uh, for their schemes. Um, the last uh, loopholes uh, that I want to mention the, is there are other ways of uh, disguising beneficial ownership. It's not only about uh, using secrecy jurisdiction, multiple layers of uh, offshore uh, trust or companies and or complex. Uh, uh, legal entities, but it's also if they're using nominees, and this is not addressed at all by the by the current EU rules. And we've seen with the Panama Paper that was uh, uh, an instrument that was highly used in the in the different schemes that were uh, exposed by the Panama Papers. So these are the loopholes in legislation, but we've got also loopholes when it comes to the transposition and then later on to the implementation. Uh, when it comes to the transposition. Um, I was checking today the communication by, by the Commission from dated November, so it's uh, still uh, uh, still quite fresh. Um, and regarding the transposition of the fourth AML directive, so the previous one, the Commission has already opened so uh, has already opened infringement procedures for non-communication of transposition measures against 21 member states. Three are currently at the stage of court referrals. Romania, Ireland, and now Luxembourg. We've one on hold Greece, nine at the stage of reasoned opinion, and eight at the stage of letters of formal notice. Um, so uh, 21 member states out of 28. It's quite, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure we can call that a success. Um, so uh, there, is a, there is the problem of non transposition, but there is also a problem of, uh, of uh, not, I wouldn't say violation uh, in the transposition of the of the letter of the law, but at least of the spirit and uh, or m what we can call perhaps a bit more lightly uh, misinterpretation or discretion in the way the, the directive is transposed. And just the, the, the example of Germany is quite telling. Uh, so in the way uh, the beneficial ownership will have to be would have to uh, to be registered in the registers. Uh, it's so it's. It, the text is a bit vague on this in the in the directive, but but the the German uh, have gone for a quite conservative approach. So it's if you can uh, uh, for direct control, it will be uh, the company declaring. But for any indirect control, so if you have several layers of uh, of uh, companies and trust and things, and the, it would be the responsibility of the beneficial owners owners to declare. So already the companies uh, we can talk about self declaration, but when it comes to the beneficial owner having to declare, it's clearly self declaration. And if you don't have strong verification mechanism in place to check the data, make sure it's accurate and it's legitimate, then uh, then that would uh, we would have done all this uh, costly exercise for nothing. Um, so, as I said, it's not just about transposition, it's also about implementation. And in the directive, you've got uh, some uh, requirement for obliged entities, so what, what we call banks, and uh, so what we call obliged entities, the banks intermediaries, to check on the customers and check, very identify and verify the beneficial owners. And we've been um, engaging with, uh, with uh, some, some, of, some sectors like the accountancy sectors and what we heard back is that it's really hard for them when uh, there is a secrecy jurisdiction or a tax haven involved in the scheme to identify the beneficial owner. So the, the requirement is there, but then, then in the implementation, as long as we don't have more transparency, uh, we don't uh, convince those tax havens so it's easier for tax haven that are in the EU, EU, but for tax haven outside the EU as well, to um, to be more transparent, then then this exercise uh, uh, is rendered very difficult. Um, so it's still a long way before we achieve full transparency. It's a really good step forward, I have to say. Um, and as I said, it's it's only going to be useful and meaningful if we can have 
easy access to data, uh, very f verification mechanism in place. And on this, I want to acknowledge the, there's a report that just came out today, I think, uh, from the Transparency, uh, Tax Justice Network uh, on, the ver on verification mechanism. Um, I haven't had time to read it, but I'm sure it's a good read. Um, and, uh, and so open data is the, is, is, is the solution. Um, one last thing uh, one last thing would be uh, just to mention something when we talk about tax haven so we just tend to think about exotic Caribbean uh, islands but uh, it's also as I said inside the EU it's also uh, still in uh, still connected to the EU uh, through, through the UK the, the overseas territory and uh, there's there's been in May uh, an amendment that passed about requiring uh, those overseas territories to establish public registers for beneficial ownership. But recently, I think it was uh, two days ago or something, um, uh, mm -hmm. apparently the, dif the, the, the government, uh, there was a backlash and the government decided to that the deadline for uh, transposition of this amendment would be postponed to 2023. Which uh, which is still which is a long way. Um, so improvements, but um, but there's a lot of delays and uh, and a lot of things to be fixed. Uh, I'm just putting back the the tax uh, hat again, uh, just to show a few uh, a tool that um, the. the um, the credit is, uh, my, my colleagues deserve the credit, but a tool that we put in place uh, as part of our, uh, our advocacy work on uh, public CBCR, public country by country reporting, uh, we just set up this online platform, uh, this tool uh, to actually show uh, the activities and payment of 20 banks, uh, uh, data from 2015. Um, and that shows, uh, so, where they actually operate. So you can check them by um, banks, uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the profile you'll see. You'll see the top uh, countries where they are the most profitable or where they are the most productive. So you can just play with the data. And uh, next slide, you can also check by uh, country. It's quite interesting if you go into the detail of the data to see a, a few discrepancies where uh, some uh, uh, some branches in Cayman Island with uh, sometimes even zero employee are super productive or super profitable. Um, and the next slide, we will show you, uh, we'll make a, um, a risk assessment based on, on different factors. So a uh, number of employees, productivity. And um, so if you, uh, usually if you are on the top left, it's uh, more risky. Uh, operations. Um, so if, if you if you want more information on this, I'm happy to just connect you to the great minds that just uh, build up this tool. I'll stop here. Thank you. And uh, I would now like to ask Sven Giegold uh, for his uh, opinion on what uh, has been uh, done. And uh, well, we, we've heard in, in uh, anti-money laundering polit policies we moved from the Stone Age. So my question would be if we also moved from the Stone Age uh, in the area of tax evasion and tax avoidance in the EU. And what are the future or the next steps that, or the next battles that needs to be fight now and perhaps even in the, in the in next five years? Thank you. Mm. Ah, sorry. Now it works. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so first, it's great to be here. Unfortunately, I couldn't follow the first part of the session because we had to vote in Econ, and sometimes you have to do the normal work in the Parliament as well. Uh, although uh, it's hard to not to be here when John Christensen is here, because I still remember warmly that this room is even a bit more fancy than the one we had when we co-founded the Tax Justice Network, and. Uh, and there's also more of us here in the room. So that is uh, great to see you again. But um, I, I would like, in order to be not too long, to, to make a few uh, points. So during the last five years, and I would say thanks to LuxLeaks and all the investigative journalism, yeah. there was a lot of law passed against um, money laundering and uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion much more law than we had passed in the 20 years before. So uh, when you see it from a European perspective, um, there was a real um, 
growth and importance. You can see it, that there was basically a permanent special or investigative committee in the parliament, which has upheld all the time the, the struggle. And at the same time, there was a European Commission, which had, as uh, Simon was rightly pointing out, a credibility problem. Uh, and, uh, but uh, what I would like to say, this was a gift. This was not a problem. Uh, this was a gift because Juncker, and I, every half a year I give my sources in the Commission a call. Has Juncker disturbed you? I do that regularly in different parts of the Commission. Always I get assurance, no, Juncker is not the problem. So uh, Juncker had an interest to deliver at least enough in order to be viewed by history books, not as doing Luxembourg and Brussels. Uh, and that is why um, I believe we have to have a proper analysis why we didn't progress. So um, the Commission, when it comes to tax, has put forward at least two proposals which are really in itself radical. It's first uh, the common consolidated corporate tax base because it basically ends for all larger corporations uh, the sovereignty of member states to to fiddle with the tax rate. This is the old formula apportionment that we, we discussed in the Tax Justice Network. So the Commission has put it on paper and put it to the member states. But it's getting nowhere because of unanimity in tax and because some member states obviously profit a lot. This is uh, second. They have said, OK, uh, we know it's difficult with tax. We move towards transparency, where we have much tougher lines to take, and we suggest binding country by country reporting public, which gives all the journalists the possibility and civil society not anymore to rely on leaks, on very complicated studies, but have the data in the open. We achieved it based on green pressure to have it in the banks, for the banks, which you can analyze, but we want to have it for all sectors. This one is blocked uh, because some tax havens in Germany are plug blocking it in the council. Uh, and uh, it's not France, it's not, uh, you not even the UK we can complain about, or Spain or Italy, Molly, Sometimes there are good things uh, coming from, from the London, even from your government. And uh, it's, uh, uh, that's hard for her to stand. But uh, the point is, um, this is blocked because Germany is support, supported by some tax havens, is blocking it, and this has to be added. The other countries do not care much. So from France, from Spain, from Italy, from the UK, there's no outcry about it. And that is the real issue. The real issue is, why is it that member states who are net losers of aggressive tax avoidance and evasion accept it? Uh, that is also what we found in the cables uh, Simon was quoting before. There was on the one hand Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands, over and Ireland, these four basically, all blocking more or less everything, often supported by the UK, but the most four the four most consistent were those. We analyzed 19 years. You, you published about this. And, uh, but the real question is not that tax havens are, do not want European progress. The real issue is why do large member states accept that Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands and, uh, and Ireland are blocking major progress? And I can tell you if there was a real priority to end tax avoidance and tax evasion, it would have ended. And that is the real issue. The real issue is, uh, why is there not enough pressure? Why is there not enough consequences of voters uh, from that? Because voters are increasingly frustrated about a double standard in the rule of law. There is a rule of law for the poor and another rule of law for those who are wealthy and uh, or privilege. There's a rule of law for small local business and another rule of law for global corporations. And that is a risk for not only democracy, uh, but at the same time of the, of the European Union. And that is the key issue. What the experience I made, and I would like to share that openly, that when it comes to public reporting, 
if there's a corporate name, if there's a nasty tax haven, if there's a wealthy individual, big story. Yeah? If a country blocking behind closed doors in a certain legislative proposal, limited public interest, limited outcry, naming and shaming which party took which position and who is in government where, relative silence, because also NGOs don't want to be seen as being too close to some political parties and less so to others. We have to focus much more energy, not only naming and shaming corporates with fair tax labels, but also politicians, governments, and expose what they do uh, uh, in bodies where it's more difficult to find the facts, but it's possible. Of course, the game would change radically if, uh, and we should demand that much more, that you do not have to steal uh, German cables to report about the European Council, but that European Council meetings have to publish uh, what has happened uh, in the meetings. But that would ease the work. But um, the real issue is why have truly progressive proposals by the Commission not been adopted? The second question is, now the Commission said, as a consequence, we will move to majority voting. And uh, in, but this is a fake proposal because everybody knows you cannot end unanimity by unanimity if you have some company, countries which do not want to end unanimity. So the big issue is, and Eva and myself, we have been insisting a lot on this, there should be, there should, uh, the, the key proposals which are distorting the common market should be proposed under Article 116. I can tell you I've sent over the years many press releases on this issue. The uptake was well, relatively limited because journalists tend to be bored by articles. They want uh, people who are guilty. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that is, I, but I can only say this is a, of key importance because here is the, the thing where I would say Juncker has not delivered because he delivered making progressive proposals, but he didn't deliver taking the consequence that they were blocked. Because if he would have said, as a consequence of that uh, blocking of key proposals, I move it to majority vote, uh, which is already possible under the treaty. Uh, by not doing this, he, I doubt that he's serious. So, and that is the first real accusation beyond what he did in Luxembourg, which is horrible, we don't have to discuss it, but what I can do since he's commission president. And, um, and then there's, so therefore I would say on tax, the key thing is get country by country reporting voted because this is real politik, it's majority vote. This is what we should focus our energy on because this is the most, uh, would be the most powerful tool. And the second is to get the the other uh, stuck proposals, in particular the CCCTB, the digital tax, voted under majority vote. And, um, and of course, uh, we may not stop talking about minimum tax rates, which is the ultimate backstop in order to end the downward spiral. You were uh, saying has not ended, which I well believe. If I speak to the industry, I do not believe that in corporate taxation, we have really done the deal with Atat 1, Atat 2, I don't believe it. When it comes to money laundering, I'm very sure. I, I think that I fully agree with what you were saying on transparency. All what you were demanding was part of the parliament position. The parliament position in the negotiations was very progressive. We wanted to end nominees, we wanted to close down all companies in Europe where the beneficial owner cannot be found. We wanted the public registers and so on. So we wanted all the trusts in. Um, all this was in the parliament position. We could only make progress. We could not win all, but we made a lot of progress. And, uh, and I generally believe we look too little on money laundering and in comparison to tax. So financial criminality beyond tax is truly a huge issue. And I'm very glad that TI is really on it. And uh, I, I think also others should see much more the link between tax criminality and other financial crimes. And the link is uh, usually uh, very strong. And um, 
lastly, on money laundering, a big achievement which was little noticed was that we managed the commission to set up its own money laundering tax uh, haven list. Uh, the um, that is uh, it's not the tax the uh, the an own list of jurisdiction with problems in money laundering. You this will be discussed for the first time in college tomorrow, and probably the first version of priority countries will be published in the beginning of February. So this is a big achievement that Europe is not only copying the FATF list, but making its own evaluations. But and there's a big but the. So for the tax haven list, the evaluations are not public. Therefore, we do not know why some countries ended up on the gray list, some on the black list, and some were not listed. The problem with the commission now with the money laundering list is they want to copy exactly that in transparency. And I use this conference to call on the commission when it comes to the money laundering list to publish all the assessments and not only the assessments of those which they put on the blacklist, but also of those which they have cleared. Because if there is no transparency over the assessment, the list will never be credible and it will uh, also not up to be not up to public debate. And until now, for the tax haven list, the um, assessments have not leaked. So I'm still searching for the source to give us this bloody assessment. Uh, because then we would have a real debate. Why is the United States of America not on the list? For instance, only a start uh, of the debate. And, uh, but this assessment we don't have. So uh, I think this is, uh, we have done a lot of progress and, uh, and the parliament has been at the forefront. The commission has followed, the member states have blocked. And that is my last sentence. This is very much to set, important to set that straight. It was not the European institutions failing. It was member states which did not want to achieve in the European institutions. And that is very important when we look to Brexit and our struggle with the populists in Europe, because they always want to say it's the fault of Brussels that we have that tax competition problem. No, it is the fault of member state governments which put their hands to protect or over certain vested interests and use European co competition in order uh, to, to achieve in the end low tax rates for those who can afford to pay more. Thank you, Sven, for this, uh, for your interventions and for your ideas and, and comments. Uh, I wanted to now again uh, invite you, uh, uh, if you have uh, any questions, just please uh, 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 don't be shy, raise your hand. And I see Molly, that's interesting. I'm not sure, it's obvious. <laughs> I want to know who's out there. Nobody says anything. I'm really intrigued. But I just wanted to say, I don't think anybody said this before. I was in and out a bit. But uh, what's really struck me that what's advanced in the time I've been here since 2014 is that the right wing in the parliament are just as irate about tax avoidance now as the left wing and that was the consequence of consecutive tax committees and so I think one strong recommendation there is that progressives in their own member states set up such committees because just seeing the evidence and, and sitting through the hearings people who thought uh, tax competition was a valid form of business competition have utterly changed their minds and sometimes put down more radical amendments than we do so I think, you know, that's something which we need to organise in our own countries to have these committees. So the people on the right who are sheltering business and tax avoiders at the moment just learn what's really going on and move their positions so that they then are not blocking in the council. Thank you. So I, I would ask Ana Gomez and then Olivia. Thank you. Thank you for this initiative. Uh, and uh, I just would like to say, uh, based on the... Uh, intervention of Mr. Bowers. I think BEPS is not biting, he's right, because it was not supposed to bite. BEPS has always been voluntary, and I think we need to actually turn it round in, a, in, in our way to actually say what we want is BEPS, the minimum is BEPS, but to be binding. Uh, and I don't think we have been too effective on that. We want more than BEPS, of course. But if BEPS would be binding, it would bite. It's not. So they do whatever they want. 
Uh, second question. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Sven um, uh, when he mentioned uh, the how uh, anti-money laundering. I mean, we we did tremendously uh, learn through the, our inquiry committees, and that showed in our progress in the anti-money laundering, namely in the fifth directive, which is to be uh, still to, to be transposed. But of course, it's still a long way. It has to be. And one thing that struck me, and I think in that uh, we in the left are normally not very, not very good, is we didn't see the clear link which could be turned in our advantage between uh, the fight against money laundering and tax evasion and tax havens and the security angle. And, but, but look at, for instance, our report on terrorism, of our inquiry committee on terrorism. The part on financing terrorism is pretty strong. And it is exactly the result of what we have learned in the old inquiry committees. I know it because I wrote a lot of it. But, but that is exactly what our governments don't do. I mean, they're very good at using terrorism to impose limitations on citizens and so on. But when you go and sit in these meetings with, on uh, the uh, uh, negotiating the directives on anti-money laundering, the guys there are there to facilitate money laundering. It's because it, they're not, they are the people from the finance ministries. They don't have a clue of indeed many of the things. So I think we need to do a better job as well that, and I agree with Molly and others that indeed having our own uh, permanent committee uh, interacting would uh, really be good, uh, even if not at the, the formal level, at least informally. I just would like to highlight uh, that the problems are not as well exclusive to the council. And, and Sven mentioned, uh, Juncker was mentioned. It's also problems with the commission. For instance, I give you an example. Uh, the commission is finally doing an investigation on Madeira, tax seven based on a lot of stuff that I've been selling, uh, sending them. Uh, on one thing, the commission is progressing and it looks like the commission has already told Portugal that either Portugal does a public uh, tender to, um, on the, the, the concession of the, the free zone, to, which was never done all these years, or it will face an infringement procedure. But on the other issue, which is the cornerstone of the question of whether Madeira functions as a tax haven, which is the jobs, the number of jobs created, the commission is wobbling. And it say, oh, it was never cl clear. It had to be jobs in Madeira. It could be anywhere in the world. And the commission is wobbling. Why? Because the people in the commission who are evaluating are the people who all through these years we're conniving with not asking questions, not, not really wanting to know. So we, and you, know, you might have Commissioner Fostaga doing the right thing, as she does, namely on this, yes, based on competition. But then it's, if at the lower level, you have a lot of people who are in one way or another complicit with the system that existed, huh, you end up and you, nowhere. Uh, so, that n not, must not be neglected. Just to let you, well, I, I could have said more, but I, it's enough. May I say only that this was Anna Gomes, our good colleague from SND, uh, and uh, I uh, pity a lot that, uh, as well as uh, Peter Simon, uh, two socialists with whom we cooperated very well, that you will not run again for 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 the parliament. That is a blow uh, for us. Perhaps you will do, Anna. Yeah. We'll be active, we'll be active. <laughs> yeah, but we would like to, we need you here, Anna, we need Peter here, and we will miss you, and we'll make more important what we are doing in the future. And Eva, unfortunately, will not present herself as well. And Molly, I'm still, we are, we are really praying all for you, Molly, to stay with us. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Olivia. I work with Eurodad, the European Network on Debt and Development um, and the Secretariat of Tax Justice Europe. Um, uh, if I can, I might offer a comment and ask uh, a question which I think has been alluded to in many ways. Um, so I think first um, to say thanks, it's really fantastic to have the ICIJ here. 
And I think it's so clear that transparency, even in small pieces from investigative journalists, has resulted in an incredible amount of legislative change and practical change across the EU and further afield. Um, and I think um, also it's, it's great to have the Greens and S&D here, both of whom have prioritised um, tax justice in the election manifestos, which will lead me to my question. Um, but I think it's really interesting um, in the discussion, it's very clear that there is both the, the role of transparency and the difficulty in progressing transparency initiatives in the <coughs> EU. And this bigger question about international cooperation, particularly in the context of one of the EU's most active tax havens potentially having far more scope um, for aggressive actions. Um, and I think um, Sven has rightly pointed to the uh, proposal for public country by country reporting and the challenges we're having with that um, in seeing progress. And obviously we've had a huge amount of progress on anti-money laundering, but we still have massive loopholes. Um, we know transparency is a disincentive and we know that this will be even more key um, when there is more space for uh, Britain, uh, the overseas territories and the, um, the dependencies to, to, to do more. Um, but we are facing a, a challenge and we have many EU tax havens who are really, really blocking that progress and introducing um, loopholes. And at the same time, we have a big gap in international tax cooperation. And I think rightly, um, we've talked about BEPS and I think the massive failings of BEPS, and we see my own member state, for example, um, Ireland introducing BEPS compliant uh, loopholes. I think there's, there's a big gap in international cooperation and we need to look beyond the OECD and a group of wealthy countries and look at the EU's role in promoting sustainable international cooperation. Um, and I think the CCCTB is, of course, a wonderful proposal, but also introduces super deductions and some concerning loopholes. Um, so I think I'm interested in the role of the, uh, the perspective of the speakers um, on international cooperation, the potential for UN tax body. And I know um, many of the speakers from the Tax of Three Committee have proposed this in the, the final report. Um, my question <laughs> is a difficult one. Um, I think it's clear that in Europe, many political groups are uh, promoting tax justice in manifestos. And we clearly have some really fantastic politicians who've led in this way and journalists who've held them to account on that. Um, but we see the European elections playing out nationally on very different issues. Um, and the Eurobarometer results show that there's consistent support among the public um, for progressive tax policies and for more revenue. Um, and yet Brexit is such a, a case of denial and, you know, not necessarily linking these up. I wonder with, with impending Brexit and also with the European elections in May, how um, I think in the different aspects in civil society um, as politicians and in the media, do we link this big lack of international cooperation to push for more transparency and cooperation using the elections? Um, I'm really interested in any thoughts that any of the speakers have on this and that we can, that we can cooperate on in, in coming months. I think it comes back very much to the point we raised in the first session, and uh, Olivia Oliver talked about this. Frenchified your name. Been here too long. Um, you know the the lack of connection between how people vote and what that vote means. Everybody performs that they're going to deal with tax. The Conservatives in Britain do that. You know the Daily Express runs campaigns on that, just like you were saying. But basically, people are being lied to, and this is why our democracies are failing. And we need to really get a grip on you know, the, the lies of the newspapers and the media distortions and so on, that means people choose policies that are against their interests. I mean, the best example in Britain is the, the Daily Express's repeated campaign against inheritance tax. You know, your children won't be able to inherit your house. But, I mean, it was 5% of estates went into inheritance tax. It's now less than that because they've increased the threshold to a million. So almost every, hardly anybody that reads the Daily Express, in fact, I would venture to say nobody who reads the Daily Express is going to end up paying any inheritance tax. So it's, it's those kind of, kind of lies that allow politicians to, to perform something on tax that they're just not following through with in terms of policy. And unless we can start connecting up the the reality of what politicians are doing with what voters think they're doing, then, you know, our democracy is really in trouble. It, it's a very wide issue, this. But I can tell you that I've campaigned repeatedly on tax. It's not a complex issue. People know they're being ripped off and it's a winner on the doorstep. 
it's more that everybody will go on the doorstep and say they're dealing with tax avoidance, and most of them are lying. Thank you. And I would ask last question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a problem with this kind of discussion, which I'm observing as an outsider. I'm not member of the parliament and not member of a European institution, although I have been working with them for the last 30 years. The discussion I hear is a discussion which is resonating in a certain echo camber amongst people who are interested in this issue and not very much beyond that. Even if I talk about uh, tax evasion, uh, that is considered one of the most public, uh, popular hobbies in many European countries, if done by local ordinary citizens, and in particular in Italy, um, people thought that was a kind of a sport, as they officially said. So how do we get out of that? When I hear you talking, I have the impression that insiders talk to insiders. I think the most clear statement on that was given by uh, you, um, saying that on certain issues you can move people, you can get public attention, and then the pressure builds up which changes something. So the question is how to scandalize things. And then to talk about this government does this and that government does that is also not extremely helpful. One of my previous uh, activities has been I've been an advisor to the uh, Luxembourg government for seven years on their sustainability strategies. We had a lot of discussion with different people in there in the government. And I would swear that 80% of them did not really know what the Ministry of Finance was doing. So even that is not a homogeneous block. You have to pick out responsible faces. And how do you do that? I think at the moment it is not something which is obvious and which is easily transported. So my question to you is, have you ever thought about a strategy of hooking up on existing discussions? Safety was one issue which was mentioned. These days we have a lot of discussions, very fashionable, to talk about sustainable finance. Criteria have been developed. I have not seen that anybody has brought in the criterion that money must come from a proven clean source with no money laundering involved in providing it, something like that. So I think there are discussions going on where you can hook on with that issue and feed it into that in such way just riding these other campaigns, bringing the issue in the public debate, because otherwise, I'm afraid, you have a very good point here, you have very good facts, even many too good facts. It was really not really disturbing what I learned here. But uh, that is not really changing the public attitude until you ride other horses, I'm afraid. Thank you. Somebody would like to comment? Yeah, if I may. Um, <laughs> I've been working in this area for 40 years for my sins. Um, um, two years ago, I uh, produced a film called The Spider's Web, took it to the BBC and said, are you going to show this film? And the commissioning editor says the public are not interested. OK. Well, I put it up on YouTube in, uh, in last, last autumn. And since when it's been seen by one and a half million people, I've toured the world with that film. The public are very interested indeed. The public are very angry indeed. And I'm talking about the general public because I've been on a 12 month tour with this film through Britain, Ireland, Netherlands, Nordic countries, most recently France, talking amongst other things with the Gilets Jaunes and the public are very engaged on this issue. I mean, see, the, the French Gilets Jaunes experience is essentially a tax justice campaign. Um, the gap is between some of the political parties and the publics they came claim to, 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 to serve. And that brings us back to Molly's point about a crisis of democracy, because the political parties themselves are not connecting to their grassroots movement. Um, I spent a month touring with the film in 
northeast of England in Brexit land. And the public there are furious about these issues. They get it, they understand it, and they feel it's their political betrayed. parties that have betrayed them. Mm. And that is the issue. Um, it's not so much that we have an ignorant public who are apathetic, we have a furious public yes. who feel they have been betrayed. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, publicly, I've, I'm very critical of the BBC. They said there's no interest. Well, I've got one and a half million bits of evidence that the public are interested. I'm just going to uh, speak up for the media. Um, not, not, uh, I do think it's a lot of <coughs> bad coverage of this kind of issues. But one thing I would say is that... Um, uh, uh, one thing that, uh, as, as journalists that we recognise about our, our readership, our audiences, is that um, uh, there are, there are, that people do get very exercised on these issues, uh, uh, particularly around uh, household name companies and their behaviours. But I think, I th this is a bit armchair psychology, but I think there's some, that there's some uh, um, lack of thinking that is encouraged uh, by disjointed media coverage and by um, uh, politicians pulling in different directions. So uh, when, you, when you have uh, finance ministers standing up and saying, we're going to have the most competitive tax regime in, in Europe and it's going to bring loads of jobs, there's lots of people who are uh, enthusiastically clapping, and when 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 he, when the same finance minister might say we're going to we're going to we're going to clamp down on 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 the nasty corporate tax evaders, they'll still be clapping. But th there's there's some disconnect between the, the and squaring that circle. I think is 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 quite hard to do, and I think there needs to be some honest discussion if there's really to be some breakthrough on that issue. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Thank you for all your questions and interventions. I think uh, that was quite uh, an afternoon uh, about tax. And uh, I would like to now to ask uh, Eva Jolie uh, uh, for sh short uh, final remarks and we can then uh, end this conference today. Thank you. First of all, I want to tell you to stay and not to believe that everything is finished because we have a very nice photo exposition after this meeting and I will leave the floor to the author of these pictures when I have made this short summary but I wanted to tell you that at once so that you shouldn't leave the room without knowing there will also be a little drink and something to eat while looking at these remarkable photos concerning the tax heavens. Well, I want to start by saying that I am happy that Sven and I made the same uh, constatation as to the CCCTB, that this is really a failure of the Commission and that it is not really a surprise when we know where, where the leader of this Commission is talking from. And uh, it's really a pity that with the state of play like it is, with the anger in the opinion, that we are not able to deliver on the tax heavens. And we know that the only way to do this, as everybody has said, is by having a common tax regime with a minimum tax rate, as you all said. But <clears throat> I want to just highlight some of the points made by the speakers. I think we all learned that in Brexit you have had dark forces behind this vote of people who have quite dark and personal reasons for this Brexit because they don't want the European regulation to apply to them. We learned that uh, uh, the UK has been home for, uh, for Russian uh, oligarchs and that uh, their money has been welcomed without uh, regard to where it came from and that 14 among them has been killed. Uh, so uh, we also learned that 
about um, uh, the, the UK press is uh, sold, most of them, and uh, you shouldn't read them anymore, but for a very few. Uh, and I think we can give the names of the newspaper you can read, Financial Time, and uh, The Guardian, and The London R Review of Books. All the others you can forget about. Well, the Independent, okay. Uh, maybe The Independent, yes. And, um, and what we were here for was also to learn from you what should we do here in the, in the EU to prepare ourselves to those dark forces coming into power in, um, in the UK. And we learned that uh, uh, we should not grant equivalence for their regulations because, or without having a spillover analysis done, because this would have very negative effects on us. I noticed that this should be done by a very independent and academic institution. And we will take that, we will note that and implement it. Uh, we learned that we should not consider only uh, England, uh, but the whole UK and their, uh, their overseas territories that the UK has power to impose regulation, and this when we have the um, equivalence request, we should benefit from that situation to have it apply also to uh, the overseas uh, territories. So we learned a lot of other things, but I think you have listened to the speakers, and this was the main message for us. Uh, that, the, that there is no other way than to have a minimum tax rate, to have the CCCTB voted, and that we are allowed to not have much consideration for this commission that did give up on it. So we have still a lot of work to do for the months that are left, trying to get through at least the uh, country by country reporting and the whistleblower protection and the good news that I heard today is that it is moving forward and that probably we could have an agreement in the council tomorrow on this also very important text with protection of whistleblower also on tax issues. So thank to all of you who took up your time to come and instruct us with your experience, we will, we will use all the information you gave us to be better. And, but tax havens is not only about figures and non-paid taxes, it is also about a lifestyle and feeling and human beings. And I will now leave the floor to our photographer who has been here with us today. His name is Paulo Woods, and he will present to you shortly his exposition before he will give it you a longer brief downstairs. So please, Paulo Woods, the floor is yours. Well, good evening, and um, I'm a, a National Geographic photographer. And what I've tried to do is to make everything you've been speaking about here today visible. You see, what you've been talking about till now is terribly important, but it's not really sexy. BAPs, OCD, CCTB, BOT, even people that are socially conscious have a hard time understanding what tax havens are, why tax avoidance matters to them. I was a war photographer working in Afghanistan and Iraq, and at a certain moment felt that photography was always attracted to the spectacular. And war is spectacular. And I wanted instead to photograph something that was not spectacular, not visible, not easy to show. So in 2013, with my colleague Gabriele Galimberti, we embarked on a three-year journey to the offshore sentence that embodied tax avoidance, secrecy, offshore banking, and extreme wealth. And we're driven by our relentless obsession with trying to translate this raw and material subject into images. 
Our hope is that we have produced a body of work that shows what these places look like, and even more importantly, what they mean. And a selection of the images are on show here today, thanks to Eva Jolie, and I invite you to come and see them on the, on the first floor. The exhibition has been in museums, galleries, festivals in almost 20 different countries around the world. And my photos have been published in the main newspapers and magazines dozens of times. But it is really great accomplishment for me to have them here shown at the heart of the EU. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you once more for coming. Thank you to all speakers and you in audience. And please have a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>